Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I wanted to, uh, my name is J.R. Fisher. I'm the president of the Board of Trustees of the Delaware River Greenway Partnership. On behalf of the DRGP, I welcome all of you to uh, our program this evening, which is our second lecture in our Heritage Lecture Series of 2022. In addition to this evening's lecture, we are looking forward to scheduling one to two additional Delaware River Heritage Lecture Series events this coming fall. So I hope you can check out our schedule there. Our organization also supports the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic as a partner organization, the Delaware River Scenic Byway, and the Delaware River Heritage Trail as lead organizations. Uh, sorry, the Delaware River Water Trail as lead organizations, and the Delaware River Heritage Trail website. <clears throat> if you appreciate these programs and tonight's lecture, please visit our web website, DelawareRiverGreenwayPartnership.org to find out how you can support our mission either through volunteering your time or through a generous donation. A uh, quick note regarding tonight's presentation, we will be recording for future viewing. We will post the video of this presentation to our website, DelawareRiverGreenwayPartnership.org under the Past Events tab in our calendar. So if you are uh, interested in keeping this lecture moving forward, we will keep participants on mute. And if you have any questions during the presentation, then please type them into the chat. We will be monitoring those questions during the presentation and we'll include these questions in a Q&A session at the end. So without further ado, uh, <laughs> further ado, tonight we are grateful to welcome Joe Donnelly. Joe joins us from the Delaware River Joint Toll Bridge Commission, where he works as the direct Deputy Executive Director of Communications and has so since 2008. Uh, during this time, uh, Joe has endeavored to research and chronicle the various river crossings owned or operated by the Commission. His research spans the development of privately owned uh, covered wooden toll bridges of the 19th century and the advent of a free bridges movement in the early 20th century, uh, and also the evolution of uh, the larger highway bridges of the 1930s and 50s. As a local resident of Lambertville, uh, Mr. Donnelly gives periodic presentations on the Commission's various river crossings to community groups, libraries, and historical organizations up and down the river. And in that capacity, DRGP is proud to present Joe Donnelly as he discusses spanning the water and time, the Delaware River bridges from the estuary to the water gap. Joe, thanks so much for being here. Uh, JR, thank you. And um, good evening, uh, river fans, uh, recreational enthusiasts, and hopefully bridge lovers. Uh, this talk was billed as a lecture, but it's probably more of a travelogue. We're fortunate to live where some of the country's first significant multi-span bridges were constructed. Delaware River, after all, was one of the first significant barriers to Western expansion after European settlement of this continent. I was asked to talk about bridges from Trenton to the Delaware Water Gap, it's going to involve a lot of bridges and more than 200 images. So uh, if you haven't seen one of my presentations before, I go fast. The stream of consciousness slideshow. If you're interested in a particular bridge, please hang in there. Other folks have their favorites too. I'll try to leave time for questions at the end. If you, uh, you were lucky enough to get here early, you may have heard some music playing before uh, this program started. And uh, that was a piece uh, called Center Bridge, Dark River, composed by Francis White, who lives near Princeton. So, um, the beginning of the piece actually mimics the sound of tires going across the Center Bridge, Stockton Bridge's steel grate deck. And it's a good starting point because bridges can have a vibe. They can be wayfinders for paddlers. They provide vistas of river landscapes and bridges are art.
They've been in movies. They've uh, been uh, mentioned in books and business logos. Bridges are on t-shirts, on note cards, and even on masks. They can be home decorations and even personal adornment. Bridges, of course, can be festive and certainly communal. And even romantic. One bridge, at least once a year, can also give you religion. Bridges ultimately are connections. Their ultimate mission is to convey people commerce, and commuters. And of course, bridges are structural and architectural. Now, since I'm using uh, the Delaware River Joint Toll Bridge Commission's uh, facilities and its resources, I want to just say a few words about the commission. It's um, a bi-state agency created by the states of Pennsylvania and New Jersey. We have 140 mile jurisdiction. Uh, we date back to 1934. Our southernmost bridge currently is the Trenton Morrisville Bridge, that's Route 1. And then the northernmost is Milford Montague, uh, Route 206, which is about seven miles, I believe, south of the New York, New Jersey state line. Um, overall, we have 140 mile jurisdiction and uh, it really extends all the way south from the New York, New Jersey state line to the Bucks County, Philadelphia border. Um, uh, there's uh, in our uh, um, bridge network, 20 river bridges, eight of which are 12 are told, 12 are told supported. Our oldest superstructure is at the Calhoun Street Bridge. It's an 1884 wrought iron bridge. And then our newest bridge is the Scudder Falls Toll Bridge, I-295, um, which was uh, one span opened in 2019 and the other opened last year. We have um, various other roadways and approach bridges, administration buildings and other support facilities as part of our system. I'm not making this up, ladies and gentlemen. We're the successor to a former agency, which is called the Joint Commission for Elimination of Toll Bridges. And uh, that actually was created in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, its mission was to uh, purchase and then free of tolls all of the various privately owned toll bridges that existed along the river. Uh, through the uh, 19th century and into the early part of the 20th century. The commission held its first meetings in 1916 and facilitated its first bridge purchase two years later. Overall, they purchased 16 bridges and those all uh, were owned um, by the two states. They used state money to buy them and um, that commission uh, never owned a single bridge. Deeds were always uh, with the state of New Jersey and the state of Pennsylvania. So uh, interestingly, 12 of those crossings still exist in some capacity to this day. Um, commission, as I stated, was uh, created in 1934, operates under a federal compact first approved in 1935. The uh, Last revision was in April of 1987, completing a process started 12 years earlier. And a major element of that uh, change was that it led the uh, commission um, to uh, take over all those former states owned bridges that crossed the river. And um, they were put under our um, responsibility and we were directed to use system-wide financing to then take care of them. So a share of the tolls that is collected at the toll bridges pay for the um, upkeep and operation of those older spans, some of which still date back 
to the 19th century. We're operated and overseen by a board of 10 commissioners, five from each state. They serve voluntarily. And uh, the mission of the agency is pretty simple. Just uh, provide safe and efficient river crossings, move people and commerce between the states. We had a 125 million crossings in 2021, which is up from the year before, which was the uh, steep uh, COVID uh, infection year, um, but we're still down from normal. Uh, going forward, I might use a couple bridge terms. The, uh, the major one is that a bridge really has two parts. There's a, a superstructure, which is the upper part. Usually in a modern highway bridge, it's a beam deck. Uh, in the older bridges, it's a truss. And then below it, it's supported uh, by masonry piers uh, and abutments. Every bridge a uh, substructure has two abutments. So one at each end, usually on the land. And then um, there can be, depending on the length of the bridge, piers also to support it. Um, you can, uh, every bridge uh, has two abutments. Some uh, may not have any piers. Um, others might have uh, any number of piers depending on the length. And I think our uh, longest now is probably Delaware Water Gap. And uh, there's so many piers on that, I don't know what the count of them is. Um, another term uh, I, I, I probably uh, might use is the uh, fact that bridges expand. They expand and contract with the seasons. So this image here uh, will show the Calhoun Street Bridge and this actually expands um, from each pier to the opposite pier. I don't know if you can see it here, there's a small letter E at the opposite side, there's a small letter F. That's the, the fixed bearing and that E is for the expansion bearing. So bridges move. And uh, this is an example of that in real life. This is the expansion um, joint, uh, sorry, the expansion bearing here. And this uh, truss work actually rolls on rollers beneath it. It's uh, 19th century um, engineering and it still works to this day. There are the rollers, they were taken out to, uh, during a rehabilitation project to be cleaned, put back in and put back into surface a service with um, probably a much more environmentally uh, safe lubricant that you see here. So this is an expansion joint at the end of the bridge. So how did we get here? How did we get to uh, a, a period of time where we have uh, these bridges uh, that we see today? We got to go back in time, maybe not this far, but at least to Indians to get an understanding of uh, our Delaware River here. And uh, the Indians uh, would uh, really not be that concerned about getting from one side of the river to the other. Uh, generally, they used it as uh, their highway, the river. So they would go up and down, as you know, traveling. And then uh, with European settlement, um, before bridges, we had ferries. Um, this is uh, a, a example of a late 19th century ferry. You can see a wire up here with the craft attached below and across the river. Here's one that um, went into the early 20th century. I believe this is up by Bushkill Falls in Pennsylvania. Uh, the owner of it is actually here in the foreground of uh, the photograph. That's uh, from, uh, you can see the automobiles in there. I would say it's from the 19-teens. Um, one interesting fact about ferries, that's probably the way, in fact, I think most scholars uh, feel pretty strongly, that's the way George Washington actually crossed the Delaware. There were no icebergs, there was sheet ice, certainly it was a cold December. Um, and it's probably uh, indicative that he would have crossed with a cannon. Um, there were uh, 
stage coaches, early stage coaches back then running between New York and Philadelphia. Uh, and of course, along the Eastern seaboard. And uh, they would have traveled across the ferries, but the bridges would have provided a more certain way of getting across the river in terms of, in times of inclement weather. And um, so that uh, also pushed for the development of bridges. Also the bridges connected early um, uh, roadways uh, network uh, that, that existed in the colonies and uh, post-revolutionary war era. We had the King's Highway that went through a portion of New Jersey. And uh, when you think highway, don't think today, this is probably what it looked like. That's an actual portion of the remaining King's Highway in South Carolina. First bridge across Delaware was at Trenton in 1806. It was a marvel, only one of its kind ever built. Open sides, roofs that ran perpendicular to the actual cartways. And one interesting feature, I believe that this is not a flagpole. It was an early lightning rod. The bridge was constructed roughly 60 years after Ben Franklin uh, discovered that, uh, or really uh, determined that uh, lightning was indeed electricity. 16 covered bridges crossed the river. And uh, these were, um, well, there were, I should put that as 16 covered crossings. There, some of these bridges had to, uh, were constructed and then had to be rebuilt for a number of reasons. Um, a second time, maybe even a third time, uh, due to uh, floods, due to um, poor construction the first time, and in uh, at least one or two cases due to fire. So uh, first one, 1806, also the bridge at Easton in 1806. And then you gotta go all the way to after the Civil War, Portland, Columbia, 1869, and uh, that uh, ended up being the last covered bridge uh, along the river and the longest covered bridge in existence in the United States when it washed away in 1955. That bridge has a plaque um, that's um, dedicated to those 16 bridge crosses. It was uh, installed by a Boy Scout troop in 1959. So in the 19th century, bridge building took place by public, I'm sorry, by private companies. There were no highway or transportation departments at the state or federal levels. And uh, these uh, private bridge companies would form, get approval from the two states in the form of a charter. They were, uh, would locate their bridges near or at former ferry sites. I mean, after all, there were existing roadways there. Um, many occasions, the ferry owner was uh, among those people inve uh, investing in the bridge. Uh, they would raise their capital largely by stock sales. Some ran lotteries, but you, you didn't raise that much money that way. And uh, they would build the bridge and then they charge the tolls, pay back the investors, and then to operate it and maintain it. And then cases where the bridge company was successful enough, uh, provide dividends back to the investors. Here's a uh, notice, uh, 1805 for uh, stock uh, sales uh, for the uh, bridge at Trenton. Here's a uh, a stock for the Columbia Delaware uh, bridge. Uh, now the, uh, the the bridges along the Delaware would always have that in the name. It wasn't for the state, it was for the river. Some rivers, uh, there's like a, the Lumberville Delaware Bridge Company. Well, there was also a Lumberville Susquehanna Bridge Company. So um, that, that helped prevent confusion. Here's another certificate, Trent City Bridge Company. One bridge company, uh, the New Hope Delaware Bridge Company, actually printed money in the form of promissory notes and not uh, like some of the other bridge companies uh, for a short-term basis. 
it was because they operated an illegal bank. And um, that was its noteworthy uh, claim to fame back in the early part of the 19th century. States actually had to take um, that bridge company over because of the Wildcat Bank. Um, here's a toll schedule from uh, 1870s at the New Hope Delaware Bridge after it had been purchased by a single man after the states put it into a receivership. That man is the only one who owned any of these bridges. He was from uh, Philadelphia. His name was actually Samuel Grant. This is his son here, William Grant, uh, posting this tolls notice uh, after his father had passed away. Some interesting things here. You can see they charge for cattle. They charge for swine, sheep. There's uh, language down here for uh, charging for lumber. Uh, we get into the early part of the 20th century. This is at Washington's Crossing. You still have tolls for livestock. Uh, but now also for bicycles, the bicycle craze um, became very big in the United States in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And then of course, uh, early automobiles, uh, which generally were owned by uh, rich people um, before mass production of automobiles. And their uh, resentment wasn't really about the cost of the toll, it was the fact that they had to stop to pay it. Uh, this is a little later. This was up at Milford Montague, and you can see the rates are going up now as the cars and vehicle. Now we have trucks uh, getting more costly. I love the language on this one, two cents for a footman. I don't know if that uh, meant that it applied to women as well. Um, so um, this is an example of uh, a bridge company uh, announcing dividends to its shareholders. We had back in the day an uh, early form of easy pass in the form of tickets uh, that bridge companies would issue. This was for the bridge at Trenton, which at the time these were issued, the bridge was owned by the Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, this is uh, the Alexandria Delaware Bridge Company. This was a bridge at Frenchtown, uh, Center Bridge, um, this is a, a, a foot ticket for Lumberville, uh, Delaware Bridge. And then at Yardleyville, they had the small tickets. Um, an interesting thing, this is a, a bridge house here. This is down at uh, Trenton Morrisville, the Morrisville side. You can see the gate here to close the bridge. Travel was largely, uh, really ostensibly only during daytime. There was no electricity. There was no... Uh, widespread gas lights to travel at night. Uh, rare were people who traveled. Uh, this is at the Yardleyville Bridge. There's the toll gate that would have gone across. That's the toll collector's house. That's, that, that house actually was moved and is now an insurance company um, uh, uh, office. Um, this is a, uh, you can, this is a little upgrade of the toll gate. There's even a, a sign telling people to stop and pay tolls. Um, this uh, here is, this is already passe. I grew up with these barrier toll plazas in both directions. And uh, increasingly with uh, each passing year, I think more and more young people are probably gonna have their mouths opening, wondering what that was. You used to pay toll on the highway. And here's modern day. Of course, we still have a bit of a toll plaza here, one direction up at I-80, but now technology, you can pay electronically. You don't need to stop, much more efficient, less uh, pollution. And now full bore, we have all electronic tolling. This is at our new Scudder Falls Bridge. And this uh, collects tolls, um, through Easy Pass, extensively 90% 90, 90 of the tolls there. And then the other 10% uh, are by uh, license plate billing. The uh, wooden bridges, uh, and even today's bridges, there's perils. Uh, fire uh, for the wooden bridges. This is Center Bridge Stockton, burned down in 1923, struck by lightning. Uh, Windstorms, 
were, uh, this is all the damage uh, to the roof as well as the sides, you can't see it here, but uh, Portland Columbia Bridge, 1929. Um, river traffic. Um, now, the, Delaware is largely uh, unnavigable, but um, there were rafts of wood that would come down. They really wouldn't stand a chance against these, but it's uh, indicative of what can happen if they did crash into them. They really wouldn't have damaged it, but, you know, could have piled up over time. Um, ice. Uh, people ask me this question, well, isn't that ice going to hurt the bridge? Well, these piers have been standing here for over 200 years. So the answer is no. Um, but if it backs up uh, the water enough, it can create a damming situation that then can flood the bridge. And when that releases, can be a torrent that comes down to a subsequent bridge. And in 1841, it was called the Bridges Frechette because six bridges got destroyed that way. That deer, by the way, in the picture I'm told, actually made it to the other side of the river. Um, and then, of course, flooding. This is up at uh, um, the Northampton Street Bridge between East and Phillipsburg, 1955 flood. And uh, this bridge survived that flood, but was damaged uh, for a period of time. This is at Lambertville. There was a free bridges movement um, that uh, occurred in these parts uh, roughly from uh, 1903 and uh, led to the creation of a commission to uh, free up all those privately owned bridges. It uh, had three impetus uh, to, uh, um, that, that built the fuel uh, to ignite that. One was the Good Roads Movement uh, created by bicyclists and agricultural interests in the late 19th century. There was the advent of um, the mass production of automobiles and the ability of the middle class to afford them. So uh, more and more motor vehicles on the road beginning after 1908. And then progressive era politics um, was a third factor uh, in that movement. Overall, uh, 16 bridges were freed. And um, the first was in May of 1918 at Lower Trenton. And, uh, and then the subsequent ones, by the way, that should be May 31st, typo on my part. Uh, that's when that uh, first began. And uh, the, um, subsequently that uh, spread over the years as the states provided money to the Joint Commission which would then facilitate the purchase. And like I said before, all these bridges uh, ended up uh, being owned by the two states and the states annually would provide money uh, to uh, the Joint Commission and later the Bridge Commission uh, to uh, operate and maintain them. That, that arrangement ended in 1987. Last bridge to be freed was the Lumberville Raven Rock Bridge that was in 1932. The um, time came to build new highway bridges and that led to the creation of the jo uh, Delaware River Joint Toll Bridge Commission in 1934. It wasn't necessarily the idea of these two men who were governors at that time, but they signed the legislation. So um, there was Gifford uh, Pinchot on the Pennsylvania side and A, Harry Moore in New Jersey. The, uh, I wanna go through these bridge crossings. I'll try to do them very quickly north to south. Trent Morrisville Bridge is our uh, southernmost bridge opened in 1952. Um, the important aspect of this one is that the approach roadway in Trenton was uh, part of the railroad right away um, that went along, here's the uh, current railroad, uh, which is now, uh, I believe Amtrak owned. Uh, that's the uh, Northeast um, corridor. And uh, so this was the uh, uh, rail property in here and it's now being turned into the highway. You'll see this uh, later on at other locations. Here's the completed bridge 
opened in 1952. And this is what it looked like uh, at that time. And uh, a few years ago, about in 2009, uh, cantilevered off the side of it to widen it on both sides. So it's a wider bridge now. That um, bridge was constructed in a manner that allowed the, uh, this to take place. You can only cantilever so far though to add width. Uh, one reason the, the bridge was needed, by the way, this is not uh, rush hour. This is uh, what the streets look like in Trenton trying to get to that, um, the existing bridges. This would have been the old uh, lower Trenton bridge, first bridge that opened there as a wooden bridge back in 1806. And then this is Calhoun Street. Look at that traffic. This is an old water plant, by the way, if you're from the Trenton area. Um, so uh, that brings us up to the Lower Trenton Bridge. Uh, it's just a short distance north. Everyone knows it uh, colloquially as the Trenton Makes Bridge because of the sign that's on it. Um, this is what the original bridge looked like, 18, this is a drawing, 1807. And what's interesting about it is people from around the world came to see this. It was a, just a, uh, a structure that no one had seen before. Not only were these beautiful portals at each end of the bridge, but then it had this open side. The floor had to, it was suspended from these huge laminated arches and that was by chains of all things. And then uh, to promote uh, the safety of the wood that it could last long, you had the free airflow, but it had roofs on it. Some other images of that bridge. Here it is the only photo I've seen of it uh, at this time. This is in the Trentoniana room collection. There's the original piers and you can see the, uh, that's been re-roofed, that's probably reason a photograph was taken of it. Uh, the railroads uh, took ownership of the bridge company, bought um, controlling interest in shares so they could run railroad uh, traffic across that bridge uh, beginning in um, the late 1830s. And uh, interestingly enough, it um, was later widened. So they ran uh, the vehicular bridge on the upstream side um, with alternating traffic, one, one direction at a time with a system of bells. And then they widened the other span on the south side, as you can see here, and also raised it as uh, the uh, engines got larger. Here they are putting an iron bridge next to it, the Philadelphia, uh, by this time it's owned by the Pennsylvania Railroad. They had bought the rights from the, um, Old Camden and Amboy uh, Railroad. And uh, this actually, the railroad was the uh, Philadelphia uh, Trenton Railroad, which essentially the uh, uh, Camden Amboy guys owned. Here's the uh, iron bridge that ended up replacing it. It was two spans. That's what, what the one railroad element. The uh, vehicular and passenger side was over here. This had two tracks, it was constructed by the Keystone um, Bridge Company, which was owned by um, Andrew Carnegie. There's a, a photograph, you can see the iron bridge here. When a steel bridge was added to it, they further widened the piers in 1892. And a second railroad truss, this one being steel, was added in in 1892. Here's how this looked from the air. You would have had uh, the, um, uh, two iron bridges, and then the new steel bridge. So here's your vehicular, two uh, railroad tracks here, two railroad tracks there. Heavily used railroad bridge. Um, and this is the only image I know of that shows it when um, the middle span, the iron span was taken out and replaced with another steel span in 1892. That didn't last uh, too long because um, in 1903, the Pennsylvania Railroad, uh, with uh, the work that they were going to do uh, with uh, Pennsylvania Station, um, uh, opening that in New York, um, put in a um, stone arch bridge just south of this crossing. 
Uh, this is the only photo I know of that shows uh, that bridge with the two steel uh, railroad spans. And here's that completed uh, bridge still in existence today and working very well. The uh, Stone Arch Bridge Railroad Bridge uh, at Trenton, now uh, Amtrak and uh, SEPTA go across it. Here's the original iron bridge still in existence. Um, uh, after the first Trenton makes uh, the World Take sign was put on it, uh, this is probably somewhere around 1920 or so. Um, and the uh, railroad bridges had been taken off this uh, many years earlier and actually uh, shipped down to the Potomac River uh, for um, a uh, Pennsylvania road, uh, railroad bridge near Washington there. But you can see how the, here's the original piers. Here's uh, the first widening of the piers for the railroad and here's the second one. So you can see how those were there. Um, that bridge was uh, free to tolls, first one across the river in 1918. Uh, by the way, that river crossing uh, was at that time still the most southern uh, bridge crossing along the river and would remain so um, all the way till 1926, till the Ben Franklin Bridge opened um, between Philadelphia and Camden. So that was uh, like, uh, like 112 years uh, where that, uh, sorry, um, uh, a hundred and um, um, 16 years, I guess, uh, for that bridge. Uh, here we are in 1928, uh, construction uh, to replace that old iron bridge. And it's the bridge that we know today, steel uh, span being built in that footbridge, uh, a, a foot uh, path of the old um, iron railroad bridges there. Here's a very interesting photo if you know Trenton today. Look at that area. It's all completely gone uh, due to urban renewal, um, which is uh, a rather sinister turn. Um, but you can see how the railroad would have come here. And this uh, portion's now uh, Route 1. These are the old toll houses here. Just, and here's what that looks like uh, um, sort of today. I, I say sort of because these two buildings here, which were built like 60s or 70s are now um, have been or are still uh, being um, taken down. Uh, we uh, put on a, a new lighting system on the bridge that is now shining with the uh, uh, Ukrainian flag colors. We move up north, we come to the Calhoun Street Bridge, which is the oldest superstructure along the river, opened uh, in July of 1861. Here's what the original wooden bridge there looked like. Just, uh, this was probably the longest uh, wooden bridge across the river, seven spans. Um, that's what the insides of it looked like. And that bridge uh, lasted uh, until uh, 1884 when it burned down. Um, reportedly due to a discarded lit cigar. Um, in 60 days, 83 workers uh, reconstructed constructed the wrought iron replacement bridge. It was sort of like uh, a tinker toy set to put together um, and done in very quick time. Uh, you know, labor was uh, rather cheap back in those days. Um, here's that bridge uh, after it sustained damage in the 1903 flood when the Yardley will birth a portion of that wooden bridge washed down and crashed into its walkway. The um, former um, private bridge owners would uh, try at uh, every uh, chance they had to make money uh, for themselves and their stockholders. In this case, uh, telegraph and early telephone wires. Uh, piled up on the bridge. There's also this sign here that I'm hitting. It's got an L and that was for the Lincoln Highway. That was uh, the first um, bridge crossing in the Delaware River for the Lincoln Highway, which uh, by the way was not government run. It was uh, a, a privately uh, a designation of uh, an amalgamation of uh, roadways 
uh, across the United States. It's a magnificent bridge architecturally, um, beautiful uh, Victorian details on it. Uh, we have put a Lincoln Highway sign on it a few years back. It now carries the East Coast Greenway between the two states. Uh, moving up river, a question I get is about this railroad bridge here, uh, which is the uh, Reading, uh, old uh, Reading Railroad Bridge now run by SEPTA and CSX uh, freight. And then there's these uh, piers that are alongside it. What the heck were they for? Well, there's what they were for. Um, and it was for the bridge that preceded the railroad bridge, which was called the Centennial Bridge, which was a uh, um, the, the, the nightmare for the uh, uh, Pennsylvania Railroad uh, Company because it was actual competition. Um, called the Centennial Bridge because 1876 and the Centennial Celebration in Philadelphia. Uh, there was the Yardley Wilbertha Bridge, no longer in existence. Um, this uh, bridge, the original wooden one, we don't know when it was constructed and opened, um, but we'll say uh, for argument's sake, uh, 1839, the bridge company was authorized in 1835. We know it went out for ads uh, for a contractor in 1837, but we don't know when it opened. And um, so uh, this is a, a, a picture of the second bridge because that first one that they built in uh, 1839 or so uh, was uh, destroyed or partially destroyed in the flood in 1841. Here's another view of it with the Centennial Bridge behind it, it's 1890s. Uh, here's the steel replacement, uh, which opened uh, in early, uh, early 1905. I believe this is probably after a flood in 1936 um, that had uh, damaged the uh, piers again. And um, the, the, the reason, other reason why is because a walkway has been added to the bridge. And uh, I believe the uh, states paid the money uh, to the Joint Commission to do that work uh, after it was purchased in the early 1920s. That bridge lasted until the 1955 flood. Look at the damage here. Um, this is the Yardley Inn, folks, if you uh, have ever gone there. So, um, and uh, luckily they had moved the old bridge tender's house here. Um, they, for a period of time, uh, they, they put in a Bailey Bridge uh, to, uh, still carry traffic over that bridge, but it had to be closed in 1861 before, um, about a month or so before uh, they were able to finally construct the bridge uh, upstream at Scudder Falls. This is a picture of the new bridge at Scudder Falls. One interesting factor on this is a walkway that this bridge has. It's the only walkway that we have with um, railings and parapets uh, high enough and a width wide enough uh, to allow bicyclists and uh, pedestrians uh, to cross the bridge with the bicyclists not having to dismount um, uh, their bikes and walk across it. So you can ride across that bridge. Great views up there, it's, it's hot. Um, this is the original Scudder Falls Bridge. It was uh, built 25% uh, uh, shares of money by the two states, and then 50% money uh, from old US highway funds. It was not uh, constructed under the Interstate um, Highway System uh, Act. And uh, this bridge was built in 1955 um, under contracts that were uh, actually uh, overseen by the uh, NJDOT. The bridge got completed, but they didn't have the roadways uh, to put to it. So the um, bridge was uh, completed in October 59, but then didn't open until June of 1961. Um, here's the bridge really on its last legs before we started the Calhoun Street project. One interesting thing is the states uh, removed an island here um, to provide the fill uh, to uh, build the uh, approaches to the bridge 
um, back in uh, the 1960s. It also, look at this, how that opened up the riverway uh, to prevent flooding. And that was uh, the uh, other overriding uh, reason for doing that. That island, by the way, was called White's Island. Here's the new bridge. We'll move up to Washington Crossing. This is our most narrow bridge. First one open in 1835, a wooden bridge. This was uh, the second bridge at that location since the first one there washed away in 1841. You can see the old Belle Dell railroad tracks running along on this side of uh, the canal there. This is in the uh, 1880s, we estimate, and look at the uh, canal. Um, this is where the uh, um, towpath really was, was on this side. When people refer to the towpath nowadays, it's really the old uh, railroad right away that they're walking or riding on. This is 1902 flood photo. Uh, it washed away in the 1903 flood was replaced uh, in 1904 and opened in 1905 with the truss bridge. Um, it's our most narrow bridge. Uh, still, uh, that narrowness is a reflection of the agricultural times that still existed uh, back then. Did not have a walkway that was added in the 1920s. Look how the landscape has changed uh, around there. This uh, a photograph we recently uh, obtained. Um, this is uh, Washington um, Crossing State Park on the New Jersey side. It wasn't even there yet. We believe this might have, uh, this might be the wooden bridge actually. This photograph is so old of the area. Um, here's another one. This photo is uh, from the uh, 1930s, I believe. And you can see now the uh, State Park on the Jersey side is coming in there. It's our only bridge with a traffic light on it to prevent crossings of uh, oversized vehicles. The bridge has only a 15 foot uh, curb to curb width. So you really have to squeeze in there. We're unfortunately with this bridge pre prisoners of our past with that one. Moving up to New Hope Lambertville. This uh, bridge was uh, the original bridge in 1814 designed by Louis Vernbog and originally an open bridge for uh, a portion of its first year when the bridge company hired a, another contractor to then cover it in the sort of uh, barn-like uh, design that we see uh, for most covered bridges. Um, but that's uh, essentially what the innards of that look like. That was a, a patent application for Louis Vernbog, the designer. An artist, out in Quakertown, Pennsylvania, Dennis Gerhardt, I should have put his name here, um, made a drawing of it as best as he could from the records because there's nothing that shows the full bridge. Um, but this is what those um, uh, portals looked at, looked like at both ends of the bridge. So you had dual cartways in each, uh, one in each direction and then dual walkways on that bridge. Here's um, a photograph of the bridge, but after the 1841 flood, you have the original surviving portion of the bridge, but the half of the bridge on the New Jersey side that washed away in that flood was replaced with another span. You can see the distances between the windows are different. And also closely up here, this uh, replacement span, three spans that went in, um, where it had a higher profile than the original Louis Vernbog bridge. That bridge lasted till 1903 uh, when uh, all but one uh, rather beat up span on the New Jersey side survived. Here's um, the remnants of the original uh, portal on the New Hope side. And look at the damage to those piers, 1903. So that got, um, oh, uh, before I go there, there's a, you know, one of the sections that washed down river. So that um, got um, replaced by uh, the current steel bridge 
Uh, it opened uh, actually to traffic in uh, July of uh, 1904, and it was uh, constructed with uh, extra strength to carry trolley traffic. Uh, the trolley uh, would uh, connected Lambertville via the Pennsylvania side. It would go down to Yardley and, uh, and then uh, cross over on the Calhoun Street Bridge to Trenton. Uh, all these bridges had wooden decks even into um, the latter part of the 20th century. This is 1924, where uh, the states paid the Joint Commission to add uh, some steel uh, plates that, to help uh, prolong the life of the wooden deck of that bridge. Um, the next bridge in this area opened in 1971. It carried uh, took the traffic, uh, Route 202 traffic, away from uh, the old trust bridge at New Hope in Lambertville. And uh, good thing it did, because that bridge wouldn't have lasted to, as, as, uh, to, to this uh, date hadn't that occurred. So it uh, takes a lot of traffic off that. Here's a, a view from the river. We have the uh, Center Bridge Stockton. This was the uh, location of the third bridge to open across the river between the two states. This is probably the third bridge. It is the third bridge, sorry, um, that was built here. The first one was uh, so uh, poorly constructed in uh, 1814 that it had to be replaced in the early 1830s. That subsequent replacement bridge uh, largely washed away in um, the 1841 flood and uh, the uh, bridge company then uh, raised uh, the piers a bit and uh, constructed this bridge, which lasted um, into the 1920s. Here's another toll gate, toll collector's house. Um, I believe this is on the New Jersey side. And uh, that bridge was destroyed in a spectacular fire, uh, if I may use the word uh, spectacular, uh, for a calamity in 1923. It uh, was recorded uh, by Edwin, Edward Redfield, famous painting in the Michener Museum collection in Doylestown. Um, he lived next to the bridge, uh, so he took notes and this is um, the image that we have of that fire. Uh, the uh, two states with the Joint Commission uh, bought, uh, bought the remnants of the bridge in 1925 for $10,000. It said uh, that the uh, um, uh, stockholders used some of the money for a big picnic and then uh, the rest uh, for, uh, you know, was divided up amongst them. So the uh, piers dating back uh, to uh, 1814 um, were, uh, were uh, encased in concrete. You can see original pier here and then how they increased the height of them after the 1841 flood there. This is a, a rehabilitation of that uh, bridge uh, several years ago. This uh, walkway here, the wood has been replaced. It now has a composite wood uh, deck on it. It has two different colors. And people, if you ever wonder why, uh, the, the, where the two colors meet, that's where the state line is. It's uh, uh, like many of these bridges down in this area, it has uh, nests uh, for, um, um, <laughs> I'm gonna say starlings, but it's not starlings. Swallows, thank you. Um, swallow nests. And one interesting factoid about this, this was the bridge that a guy who wanted to be the first in the country to cross the United States by a lawnmower uh, across the Delaware River here uh, about 10 years ago. There is the photo of them doing it. Uh, the Lumberville Raven Rock, that's a pedestrian bridge. Uh, this is probably the second most photographed and painted uh, bridge along the river. Uh, the first one being the bridge at New Hope Lambertville. Um, this uh, bridge was uh, uh, 
uh, let me just go back a second, uh, opened in 1855, but it took a long time for it to be constructed. And um, this is a, a picture of that wooden bridge. Um, it, it, was, it didn't really have a flood threat um, because it, it was built after the 1841 flood. That's a, a, a lumber raft in the foreground. That's uh, from the Pennsylvania side, by the way. Um, in the 1903 flood, one span uh, was washed away and that was replaced with a steel truss. And uh, that bridge uh, continued in service into the 1940s. This is an interesting photo. That's a pontoon bridge because the US Army used the parkland on the other side for a camp. And what they tested here were various pontoon bridges. We're in the middle of World War II. And so they tested out various types of, of bridges uh, to get a, across um, um, uh, rivers and streams, either in Europe or um, over in, um, in the Pacific Islands. In uh, 1947, uh, that wooden bridge was replaced under a contract with the Roebling uh, Company. It was made into a pedestrian uh, suspension bridge. Um, and uh, that was a sweetheart contract uh, for the two states uh, and the um, bridge commission on that one. The contract was for $75,000 to construct that and uh, remove the old uh, wooden bridge and truss bridge there that preceded it. Um, this is uh, indicative of the process that was used uh, over the past 20 years where the commission um, took off uh, old lead paint off these bridges. So you put in containment and vacuum systems uh, to get all that lead paint off and then repaint it uh, with uh, sa safer uh, coating systems. So that's uh, how that looked. Um, this bridge no longer exists, exists uh, Point Pleasant Byron Bridge. Uh, first bridge opened uh, just shortly after the Lumberville Bridge probably accounts for, uh, again, while neither of them were all that profitable. Um, and um, that had a, a rather checkered history. So uh, here's its uh, demise eventually in the, the 1950s. Um, that one wooden uh, version of that bridge actually burned down in, um, I think it was 1892. And then a subsequent version, uh, a, 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 a steel bridge, which a remnant of that um, was used. They had a, a, that, that original bridge, which would have looked like that all the way across 1892. All that got washed away in uh, 1903 and then subsequently replaced um, with um, a, a, a steel bridge and then that washed away in 55. So here we are with the remnants of that and that's what those uh, remaining piers look like today. Uh, that was never owned by the uh, bridge commission. We get that inquiry every once in a while but uh, the deeds to that were never transferred uh, uh, because there was no bridge there, uh, certainly in uh, 1987. Euler'stown, Frenchtown, this was, um, again, a bridge where we don't know when it opened, uh, but uh, managed to be opened uh, after the 1844 flood. Uh, this is a rendering of it, what it looked like uh, by an artist. Uh, this is up in the collection at Lafayette College. Um, that wooden bridge uh, was uh, partially damaged in the 1903 flood, two spans closest to the Jersey side. And um, there's the uh, steel replacements. You can still see a uh, toll gate on this bridge. This is probably shortly after its 1903 opening. Watercraft here and uh, below the bridge. Um, that was replaced uh, completely. Uh, the uh, uh, metal spans, as well as the old lattice wooden bridge, uh, replaced in uh, 1931, um, uh, jointly by the two states in a project overseen by the former Joint Commission. And that uh, steel bridge uh, 
continues to this day uh, where it's uh, crossed uh, annually um, by a pilgrimage that goes uh, from uh, Great Meadows in New Jersey to the um, um, Chacoba, is it? Uh, um, shrine uh, near uh, Doylestown. Upper Black Eddy, um, Milford Bridge, this is uh, originally uh, uh, spanned in 1842, luckily after the uh, 1841 flood. Here's what that original wooden bridge looked like. Um, it had uh, dual cardways. Three span bridge, by the way. Here we are after the 1903 flood, the span on the Jersey side was washed away. That ended up being replaced. Uh, uh, quite a bit of the timber uh, was used from the Regalsville Bridge upstream, which was washed down in the 1903 to re, uh, reconstruct the Jersey side span. And you can see how much better shape that replacement span is there compared to uh, the rather warped and uh, uh, weathered sections here uh, on the center and Pennsylvania sides. Here's the bridge on its last legs. I figure this photo probably dates uh, from the early 1930s because it was freed in 1929. It's got a free bridge sign on it. Um, it's looking pretty ragged and uh, they would have been reconstructing this in 1933, as you can see here. That bridge didn't open, however. Uh, many people say it opened in 1933. It didn't. It opened January 13th, 1934 in a driving rainstorm. I believe it was a Saturday. Let me just bring that back real quickly. Um, it has on its marker the fact that the steel used in it was from the Bethlehem Steelworks uh, over in Pennsylvania. And several of the bridges along the river were that way. Here's a photograph of the bridge. Um, I believe this one is from the 1950s. Yeah, as you can see, uh, still uh, a lot of agriculture. Here it is with the railroad in front of it. Go up to uh, Regalsville um, Bridge, the uh, first one opened there in 1837 um, and uh, severely damaged in the 1841 floods, in fact, washed away. Uh, that replacement, uh, which you see here, lasted again till the 1903 flood. Uh, two spans washed away. Short time later, uh, that surviving span on the, I believe it was the Jersey side, uh, sorry, uh, looking at that Pennsylvania side was uh, uh, just collapsed. Was replaced with a Roebling suspension band, uh, bridge. It's a multi-catenary bridge. Um, which means you've got this uh, section here with this uh, cable running from one tower to the next. That's called the catenary. And it has three of those. So it's a rare multi catenary vehicular bridge. I don't know the date of this photo, um, but it, uh, that bridge opened. It was the first of the bridges uh, that were uh, washed away. Um, in the 1903 flood to be re uh, reconstructed and open in April of 1904. Um, this uh, gentleman's name is Ben Transu, and that's his wife, Alice Young. Um, he was the bridge guard at this bridge for the longest time. Uh, that's uh, from the Regalsville Library collection. In 1936, there was a major flood along the river, it didn't really uh, damage superstructures, but at Rigglesville, look at the damage it did to its bridge pier. And uh, subsequently there was a project to uh, completely reconstruct that pier. Um, it's a concrete pier uh, that you see there. And that was that work later on in 1936. This supports that tower. Uh, so this work could be done, ingenious project uh, done at that time. This bridge is notable because it's the last one along the river to have a wooden deck. And here they are replacing it in 1984.
At this time, it was still owned uh, by the two states, um, but they ponied up the money to the um, bridge commission so that it could do uh, put a steel grade on that bridge. And there's the bridge as we see it today. Here's a river view with uh, kayakers coming beneath it. These are uh, kayakers are with the Delaware uh, River Sojourn, which occurs annually in June. And I've uh, participated in uh, 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 you know small sections of it on two occasions. Uh, when I retire, I hope to do a lot more. Um, moving up, we have a modern day I-78 toll bridge. Uh, and uh, this is one of the most heavily traveled truck crossings in the United States, connecting uh, the warehouse region of the Lehigh Valley and really uh, uh, all the way out into Berks County, down to Harrisburg and York, Pennsylvania, and even trucks traveling up to Canada. Um, very heavy truck traffic um, and a uh, strategically important uh, uh, bridge uh, to uh, to the overall economy. Here's uh, construction uh, back in uh, by this period. This had to be uh, early 1989 because it opened in the latter part of 1989. Uh, before it opened, one uh, development that occurred was out on the New Jersey side. Um, there were collapses in the roadway, and the reason is that it's karst limestone beneath it, and uh, State of New Jersey, uh, the, the, to its credit, um, uh, the, the, the facetiously um, gave this uh, to, or, or passed over the responsibility for this section uh, to the Bridge Commission along with the bridge with Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, so this became a commission responsibility. We own this uh, section of roadway up to the uh, uh, first exit in New Jersey. And uh, back in the, uh, this of course was repaired before uh, um, the bridge opened, um, but it, that uh, subsidence uh, problem uh, remains in the uh, around 2007, eight and nine commission, here they are injecting uh, grout underneath uh, the ground there to uh, prevent uh, further problems of subsidence on that roadway. And uh, probably I'll have a rehabilitation coming up in future years. And again, uh, further efforts to make sure there's no collapses. Uh, we have the Northampton Street toll bridge. This is um, bridge is under rehabilitation right now. It's a challenge because it's a heavily used bridge. Um, the uh, original bridge here opened in 1806 uh, was a wooden bridge. It was designed um, um, by a uh, bridge designer out of uh, Massachusetts, um, whose first name I can't remember now, but uh, last name was Palmer. Um, it might have been Theodore Palmer. Um, uh, Timothy Palmer, thank you. Timothy Palmer. And um, that's what the original wooden bridge uh, looked like. A really interesting structure. Here's uh, the portal on the eastern side. Um, and uh, here it is uh, really in its uh, latter years. An interesting uh, factor about that bridge was when they um, constructed the steel replacement bridge, which is still standing today. Um, the contract uh, specified that the um, traffic had to continue moving across the old wooden bridge. So they took off the top of it uh, this is that wooden bridge deck um, still in play there. And they essentially built the steel bridge allowing uh, around it so the uh, wooden uh, deck could remain in surface. Here's the old uh, piers here, the new piers being constructed for the steel replacement bridge. They put on very wide walkways onto that. Um, and that would allow for passage of um, horse-drawn vehicles. You can see how narrow they were, and they could squeeze by enough in the same for the trolleys that went across. So they were able to um, construct this bridge 
uh, allowing for originally uh, slow moving traffic uh, on the sides of it. This is, uh, by the way, my theories because we, there's no documents, but it's the only thing that makes sense. Um, and then did the um, rest of the bridge or the center, center portions with traffic moving on both sides uh, later on. So this uh, is a picture of that bridge after its uh, completion in 19, I'm sorry, in 1896. Um, like its uh, other bridges up and down the river has had its uh, flooding challenges. And its big, biggest was in 1955 when the center span was washed away. Here's uh, uh, that bridge. You can see the damage that was done to it. In the background, a temporary Bailey Bridge can be seen here uh, between this bridge, which is colloquially referred to as the Free Bridge, and then the uh, uh, toll bridge up here is the uh, toll structure to differentiate between the two. Just a beautiful bridge. Um, one of only two like it in the world. Um, there's a website called Historic Bridges. It ranks that bridge as a 10 out of 10 in both uh, national and local significance. The only bridge like it in the world is in Budapest, Hungary. And uh, you can see it's got uh, familiar lines. It's a much beefier bridge, um, but both of them are actually cantilever truss bridges that look like suspension bridges. They are actually truss bridges. The interesting thing about this one is uh, two women who are up here um, on uh, the steelwork of that bridge. Must have been a nice day. Um, uh, this bridge here, the Eastern Phillipsburg Toll Bridge, at one time, uh, we believe, uh, was the largest single span truss bridge in the United States. It was constructed in 1938. And uh, that's what it would have looked like at that time. That is one uh, very strong steel truss bridge. Here's a view with the uh, Northampton Street Bridge and then down river to the railroad bridges. I wanted to show them because of this next picture before these railroad bridges went in, uh, in the uh, latter part of the 19th century. Uh, in the middle part of the 19th century, they were preceded by a double decker wooden bridge, which is very interesting. Um, so you would have had a railroad traffic along the top, railroad on the bottom. Uh, including uh, a, a connection with the Belvedere and Delaware uh, River, I'm sorry, uh, Railroad. Farther to the north uh, from Easton and uh, Phillipsburg, we have the Rivered and Belvedere Bridge. That's a four span bridge. The original wooden bridge looked like this. Um, and uh, there's a uh, toll gate there with its uh, rather uh, interesting uh, period uh, toll collector. You get an idea of, of, of what these uh, uh, wooden bridges look like. Uh, that washed away in the 1903 flood was uh, replaced and opened in the latter part of 1904. This individual up here that you can see is a fellow named Murphy Jones who uh, passed around a hat, I believe he might have been partly uh, inebriated and uh, collected money uh, to jump off the bridge. His trick was he knew where the deep end of the water was and also probably spread his arms to slow his descent. Uh, he did this um, a number of times. Here we see the bridge in 1953. Um, you can see the landscape. Uh, around it here. This is Belvedere over here. This is uh, Lower Mount Bethel over here, the Riverton section of that. Um, there used to be a bridge up river of that called the Upper Mount Bethel Delaware Bridge. It was uh, owned and operated um, by the uh, Knowlton Turnpike and uh, Bridge Company. Uh, which was really a minister um, who invested in buying an old Lackawanna, rundown Lackawanna railroad bridge 
I uh, bought it in 1915. And um, this, uh, the Joint Commission really tried to get this uh, bridge purchased. Um, after it purchased it, it realized what bad shape it was in because uh, the good reverend uh, had never uh, maintained it in uh, the roughly 14 years that he had owned it. Um, it was a, a, a very narrow uh, bridge, each um, um, particular passageway on it. This is an interesting uh, postcard of the bridge. You can see a toll collector's house here, another toll collection booth on this side. Um, I don't know why these people are on the railroad track. I just hope they're working on it, um, but that's a dangerous place to be. There's a view of that bridge uh, in 1954, uh, before it was uh, uh, shut down and taken out of service. Um, it was uh, still owned by the two states at that time. And uh, it's uh, interesting to look here um, at the, uh, this would have been Route 46 here going up. Um, And here's the bridge. I don't know the full story on uh, the, that collapse section there. That was uh, um, done by the contractor uh, to remove the bridge or some other reason, but it's no longer there. In fact, uh, portions of the abutments were uh, removed uh, years later, the abutments that still remain, and used down at the Riverton Belvedere Bridge. Uh, moving up, uh, the Portland Columbia Bridge. Uh, uh, was opened uh, by the Bridge Commission in 1953. One of three bridges uh, up in the upper Delaware section of uh, the jurisdiction that were opened in 1953. Here's um, uh, early construction of uh, piers on the Pennsylvania side. I think these were piers four and five. And um, these are land-based piers. And you can still see a house standing over here that was eventually removed over on the Columbia side of the bridge. Uh, this bridge, like Delaware Water Gap, has um, very interesting cylindrical uh, shaped uh, piers. Uh, the, the, they're the only two bridges that we have in the system like that. This is the uh, um, pedestrian bridge north of that. Um, and this diver here is actually doing bridge inspections for us. Um, one thing we check the bridges for is for scour, which is a primary uh, a cause of bridge collapses around the country. Um, this is the pedestrian bridge upstream, uh, a more historically significant bridge uh, crossing. Um, and uh, this is a uh, postcard image of that, uh, of that uh, four span bridge. Uh, that bridge was originally a bridge there was conceived in 1816, but it took until 1869 and actually two separate private bridge companies to finally uh, construct it. The first one just never got off the really off the ground. Um, and in 1839, the effort was rekindled and the uh, probably leading force of that was this man here. His name was John Inslee Blair, namesake of Blairstown, New Jersey. Um, he was a railroad magnet, but unlike most of the robber barons of the 19th century, um, was uh, philanthropic uh, at a very early age and um, uh, lived very humbly in a, in a uh, wood frame house in Blairstown till he died in 1899. Interestingly, uh, his, um, a bust of him is in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Uh, Portland uh, didn't get um, established as a municipality, a separate municipality out of uh, Upper Mount Bethel Township until the latter part of the uh, uh, 19th century and uh, previously was known as Dills Ferry and then later Columbia Station. So um, the wooden bridge gets constructed. Here's an image of that while it was still there, a beautiful aerial image. Um, and what I wanna show here on this are these railroad tracks where I'm moving the cursor here. 
uh, that go up river and all the way up here into the Delaware Water Gap, New York, Susquehanna, and Western Railroad. Um, the uh, bridge like uh, we had down at Calhoun Street where they had telegraph and tele telephone wires, this bridge company um, would uh, use its uh, sides for ads, originally Sazadon uh, a, 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 a toothpaste uh, in the early part of the 20th century and then later Coca-Cola advertising. An interesting fellow who uh, spanned the time of uh, ownership of this bridge uh, when it was privately owned and then owned by uh, the two states and operated by the old joint commission and then later on um, owned by the two states and operated by the bridge commission was this fellow Charles Newsba Newbaker. Um, he was uh, a local legend. And you can see uh, by the way he is dressed so natally, um, very proud of his job and position. It's the, of all the uh, photographs that I've found in our archives, the only individual picture that's an eight by 10. So the photographer must have really been smitten by this man. It's uh, said by the legend that um, when it rains hard up there that uh, his vestige appears with the lantern. He also was uh, known uh, to have stopped uh, Eleanor uh, Roosevelt for crossing the bridge and speeding. Um, way back when she would drive the country around the country, she was adamant about driving herself. So it's another story. This is the closing of that bridge in 1953. Uh, I want you to look closely here. Um, at that portion of the bridge. That is an Appalachian Trail marker. So um, this bridge was closed in 1953. This is the original bridge crossing point for the Appalachian Trail, which now crosses the Delaware Water Gap Toll Bridge. And uh, the uh, bridge guides, uh, I'm told, uh, from back in those days, uh, when you got, if you were coming from the South and got to Delaware Water Gap, um, you could, you had the choice of fording across the river, which I think a few adventurous people did at uh, times of low water, or you walk down, um, it was probably uh, an, an additional eight miles uh, to reconnect the trail, but go across uh, the bridge uh, at uh, Portland, Columbia, and then uh, back up uh, to the trail as we know it today. Uh, that bridge lasted uh, and got washed away in the 1955 flood. Just, uh, you can see the power of uh, flooding and one surviving span on the New Jersey side. And that was replaced with the steel uh, pedestrian bridge in 1958. Here's uh, Charles Newbaker, might have been retired by that time. Uh, we added a uh, crossing, um, a, a state line marker to this bridge. These were uh, bicycle riders uh, looking to do um, an experimental ride of the uh, forthcoming 9-11 Memorial Trail several years ago and crossing there. Uh, this is also the crossing point for the Liberty to Gap Trail. Here's an image. You can see from uh, the design of the bridge, the way uh, and what was used sort of mimics the old uh, wooden bridge that stood there for so long. Uh, traveling farther north, we get to today's Delaware Water Gap. Here's that former New York um, Susquehanna Western Railroad right away. Another railroad right away that's being used for a highway, much like as what occurred down at uh, Route 1 in Trent. That's a postcard, by the way. Here's um, the uh, railroad bridge, which was at Dunfield uh, um, at the water gap on the New Jersey side uh, prior uh, to the construction, of, really several years prior to the construction of uh, uh, the highway through the Delaware Water Gap. You can see the rail bridges there in front of that old station. Uh, if you went north 
of uh, the, 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 the railroad did not cross at where the um, uh, roadway bridge is today. It actually went another mile north and crossed on this bridge, uh, which is called the Caramac Bridge, about a mile north, Delaware Water Gap. Here's what that looked like. And those piers, if you ever venture up with there, are still there today. And that's what they uh, now look like. So uh, Delaware Water Gap Bridge was constructed in 1953. Really, the whole project was uh, seven miles long, involved both states. Um, the bridge commission was uh, section was pretty limited to the bridge and a small section of roadway at both ends. Um, but then there was the highway bridge uh, that was constructed uh, by the highway departments in both states uh, leading to and from the bridge. Uh, and that project began in 1951. Um, hardest part of constructing a bridge is always uh, the um, a, a substructure works. So we're getting into the stage now, uh, a latter stages of this in early 1953 here. Um, here we are uh, just a couple months later, late April. And then here's in June, you can see the steel work going in. And uh, after that, uh, it's, it gets pretty easy. Here's uh, an early rendering of what that bridge was to look like, it's pretty close to um, exactly how it was uh, planned. The bridge originally carried not I-80, but US 611, um, which uh, that modern highway that we now call I-80 was originally US 611. Um, this is the old barrier toll plaza there. I don't know why this was closed for this photograph, um, but you can see the oil slicks there. So this was after clearly uh, when the bridge opened. And there's what that uh, toll plaza looks like. Excuse me. Um, what that toll plaza looks like today. Um, one interesting thing recently was uh, we had a, uh, a truck overturn on its way to the bridge and livestock got out, had to be uh, um, all a uh, maintenance worker along with other ones trying to retrieve uh, these running sheep. Um, the bridge carries the Delaware Water Gap. Here's the marker to it, including uh, mileage to Mount Springer Terminus in Georgia and Mount Katahdin in Maine. Here's a couple of uh, through hikers, roughly 700 uh, individuals hike uh, the trail end to end, meaning they go across this bridge at some point each year. Uh, roughly 3,000 um, um, individuals attempt to do the hike uh, in a single year, but only 700 actually accomplish it. And that's the uh, end of my presentation. We can open it up to questions. And uh, I thank you. Joe, that was a uh, excellent discussion. Oh. We appreciate that. Um, I, we did have some questions uh, that, uh, that came through in the chat. Um, I've done my best to kind of uh, loop some of them together. Okay. Um, so one of the one of the the first ones that I thought was pretty interesting was um, how uh, the question is how was the Trenton makes slogan chosen? Um, the, the slogan dates from the Trenton Chamber of Commerce. They ran a contest uh, 1909, and um, a, a man. Um, named Roy Heath won it and uh, came up with the slogan, which was uh, the world takes Trenton makes. And that never appeared on the bridge in the mid um, 19 teens. The uh, Trenton's mayor, uh, Frederick Donnelly, no relation, um, uh, put together an effort to raise money to then finally put the slogan on the bridge. And he rework uh, the wording to Trent makes the world takes it was put on by the RC Maxwell um, uh, company uh, billboard company in 1917 
has uh, been replaced many times. The original uh, sign was illuminated. It had uh, 2,400 incandescent light bulbs. And uh, unfortunately, I could bore you to tears, but that's the thrust of it. Uh, Bridge Commission has owned uh, the sign and uh, the uh, slogan uh, since, um, I shouldn't say we own the slogan, we, we protect it in the public domain um, since uh, the, the uh, 1990s. Great. Um, the other, another question that came through was, um, and I know you mentioned uh, the, uh, the Roebling span. Um, how many Roebling spans are there across the, uh, across the Delaware River? Well, um, on, in our section of the river, there are two, one at Lumberville, one at Rigglesville. There is another one um, up in New York that's probably more famous than our two, uh, which is the Lackawaxen Bridge, which was originally constructed as um, an aqueduct, a, a canal bridge that carried the, the canal, the, um, I think, uh, Hudson, Delaware Canal um, ac across the river. Uh, but has since been converted to a roadway bridge. Yeah, I've uh, been across that bridge myself. It's uh, it's pretty impressive to cross since you you're kind of down in what would be the canal trough. So it's a really fascinating span. Mm -hmm. um, so then there was a question about maybe a Roebling span that went from the PA Canal to Hendricks Island, uh, north of New Hope. Uh, uh, there there was a. Um, a Somebody owned, whoever owned the island put a bridge in there that was uh, not a, um, a bridge that went across the river. It was a short span. I don't know the years of that, but uh, there, there was at one time a bridge, and I don't know if it was a, a roving constructed bridge. It makes sense, though. I mean, um, rovings uh, were nearby. Whether I always thought it was a chain bridge, not a suspension bridge, but I just don't know enough about it. Fascinating. Um, and then um, did the uh, the private bridge owners fight against the free bridge movement at all? Uh, not the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, they were the first to sell and were happy to do it. Uh, they, were, they had no interest in dealing with uh, um, automobiles and you know, people who, you know, would protest over paying uh, the pedestrian toll to cross that bridge. Um, so they were more than happy to sell it. Um, there were some bridge companies, most notably the bridge between Easton and Phillipsburg. I wouldn't say they protested it, they resisted it. Um, and, um, and certainly that reverend up at uh, the Knowlton Turnpike Bridge that I mentioned, uh, he was very resistant. Um, and uh, the, the reason the Eastern folks, the Eastern Phillipsburg folks, the ones who were investors in it, uh, resisted it was because it was a moneymaker, that bridge. Um, you know, substantial dividends for those private owners. So they resisted it. And then um, there was uh, one other that uh, it'll, it'll come to me that uh, uh, might have been of interest as well. But uh, for some of these bridge companies were happy to get out of it. The advent of the automobile was coming. They had wooden decks. They were fearful of combustion engines. Um, and once one bridge sold, uh, especially one as substantial as the uh, uh, Pennsylvania Railroad uh, Bridge, um, you know, it took traffic away from those that still had tolls on it. Uh, the Calhoun Street Bridge, uh, that was uh, certainly another one where the uh, owner of that uh, resisted uh, selling. Uh, you know, they states had a pony up more money to sell. All right. Um, and then uh, I guess you might have mentioned this in your presentation, but um, I'll reiterate the question anyway. Uh, the question was, who is the designer of the span at Frenchtown? Well, uh, I would say that uh, I believe I would have to double check my notes. And I really should have included them in this uh, um, presentation. And I'm uh, pretty certain about it, that it was Edwin W. Denzler, who was uh, a chief engineer of the commission in the latter 50s, early 60s. 
Uh, he started work here as a young man out of, uh, um, I believe it was uh, uh, Pennsylvania University. Uh, all the accounts uh, at uh, bridge commission meetings was a very hard working conscientious fellow. He designed that bridge. He also designed several others along the river, including the current Lower Trenton Bridge, uh, count the um, Center Bridge Stockton, um, the uh, bridge at uh, um, Upper Mount Bethel uh, Milford, um, the Easton Toll Bridge uh, is probably his most significant one. Um, he, uh, in the case of the bridge at Trenton, it, it'll say that it was designed under the supervision of um, uh, Lewis Folk, who was the uh, supervisor and chief engineer at that time. But the uh, fellow who designed it under his uh, supervision was really um, Edwin W. Denzel. Wish I included his photo. Um, he deserves uh, more attention. Great, and um, I guess the this is maybe a question more about sort of the I would say maybe the the technology of the time, but it seems in, in earlier in your presentation you mentioned that many of these spans uh, were constructed at points where there was originally um, you know river crossings, whether people forded the river river in those locations or eventually ferries that came you know, came to use. Um, but as a, uh, you know, a resident of Pennsylvania myself and the, the number of covered bridges that span the various creeks and streams here in, you know, Bucks, Montgomery and Chester counties, um, you know, it seems that many of the covered bridges that were built during the, the, the middle part of the 1800s uh, were destroyed in, in floods, especially that 1903 flood. Um, so were these uh, covered bridges that were built during this time, was, was that essentially kind of the pinnacle of the technology? And then follow up question to that is when they were replaced by the steel spans um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, um, were those spans designed uh, for uh, floods or even future floods? You know, is there any concern about, uh, you know, floods damaging the current bridge spans? Well, I, you know, unfortunately, I, I don't, um, I, I, I can't speak to what private bridge companies did. Um, and, uh, you know, some of those bridge company records, that, I mean, they just don't exist. Uh, very few records exist uh, from the actual bridge companies. Um, but there are cases where those, um, uh, those uh, piers and abutments have been raised over the years. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, in, in terms of the steel bridges, uh, you know, when they're, we've raised uh, piers and abutments from what I understand. Um, I wasn't alive at the time. We're talking on uh, some of the, you know, like Upper Black Eddy, Milford, uh, Eulerstown, Frenchtown, they, they probably raised them a bit in that process. That's why there's so steep inclines going up to them. So, um, but I, I don't have a definitive answer to that. So, um. fair enough. And then um, there's just uh, I think one, one or two last questions, real quick. In the interest of time, I think them will close things out. But um, you mentioned that the uh, span at Trenton was the southernmost bridge uh, for quite some time until the the Benjamin Franklin Bridge uh, was built. Um, what was the uh, I guess what was the what was the reason that the uh, that that was the southernmost bridge for quite some time? I mean, I know that the uh, the river gets quite wide uh, the further you get down into the estuary, but were there were there other uh, economic impacts or kind of what was the was the driver of of, of that era? Yeah, I'm not I'm I, I guess I've seen a few clips on that, but when you think of, think about it, where would be the first place you would build such a bridge? It would be between the two most heavily populated areas, and that was Philadelphia and Camden. At the time it was built in uh, 1926, by the way, um, it was the southernmost bridge. Uh, I don't know why I spaced out on that, but it was 120 years. It's a long time. 
Um, so the uh, bridge at Trenton, 120 years. But the one uh, between uh, Princeton, I'm sorry, uh, um, between Philadelphia and Camden, 1926 is when it opened. It was at that time, the longest bridge in the world. So, you know, here's your answer. <laughs> right, right. So probably uh, technological advances and, uh, you know, interest in the automobile and, and desire to oh, make that span. Oh, right? the demand, yeah, the ferry uh, operation probably wasn't as, a, well, certainly wasn't as, in, as efficient. Um, and then, you know, there were advances in steel. There continues to be, um, you know, steel uh, that, 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 that you would get for a bridge today. Um, if we were to do a repair at the uh, New Hope Lambertville Bridge, it's going to be vastly better than what was used to construct it in, in 1904. So, um, you know. Great. And then the last question is, there's been quite a bit, a bit of interest uh, from the participants in, um, you know, learning more about the various bridges. Um, we will have a copy of this uh, presentation this evening posted to our website, Delaware River Greenway Partnership.org. But the question is, does the commission itself maintain either a museum or, uh, or a place to learn about this, the various bridges uh, that you've presented this evening? No, I'm uh, sort of a relic that does this. Um, and I, I don't know if my successful, successor will endeavor to do it as well. Um, I guess it's just a point of background where there is no museum. Um, my interest in it is, uh, is accuracy. I'm a former newspaper reporter and it, it drives me nuts when I read materials that's wrong and, uh, and then it gets repeated. So um, a lot of the literature that's out there just has stuff that gets repeated that's wrong. Um, and in some ways, uh, I know at, at our own commission, some of uh, the materials that we have in our own manual is wrong and I just endeavored to correct it. So, uh, um, so there's nothing like that. I would advise people to go to the website. Um, I am in the course right now of updating the uh, entries for the um, um, Portland Columbia Bridge. Um, the pedestrian bridge there, which has a, a, a very interesting history to it. And uh, somewhere within the next year, I'll, I'll complete that. I started writing it, um, but I just haven't had time and I probably won't be able to get back to it till uh, we issue our annual report. But, um, you know, you can start there. There's uh, some um, 2014 um, annual report will have um, a story on the uh, 200th anniversary of the uh, uh, New Hope Lambertville Bridge. So there's information there um, on the bridge, uh, free bridge movement that would be uh, in the uh, 2016 annual report. So occasionally there's expansive uh, articles in, uh, in those annual reports if I have the time to do them. So um check back and there might be some other stuff on the uh, on the website when time allows my uh, primary mission is to um get word out to the public on stuff at the here and now um and i have a little window of time right now we do have a project underway at north anthem street uh bridge but it's i'm no longer uh, inundated like with discover falls project so um, hopefully I'll have a chance to do so, a little bit more of the bridge history stuff. Um, if I might use the time, there's a fellow over in Pennsylvania who's written a book. If people are interested in covered bridges, um, his last name I think is Convoy. Uh, and uh, that book is coming out shortly. Uh, he's out of Percocy and it's on the uh, covered bridges of uh, Bucks County and includes uh, some of the river bridges um, in our jurisdiction. And uh, my uh, dealings with him is that he's um, very interested in accuracy as well. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Great. Joe, we wanted to thank you so much for, uh, for this evening's presentation. It was incredibly informative. And uh, 
I guess one one last question I thought was interesting mm. I'll throw in there is uh, do you have a favorite bridge? And if so, which one is it? Um, favorite bridge would be uh, Northampton Street Bridge between East and Phillipsburg just because of its uniqueness. Yeah. Neat. That's yeah. excellent. It's a pity people don't know more about it and how, you know, it, it's the only one of two like it in the entire world. Uh, while we're on that, by the way, I just want to give kudos to somebody. Um, I don't know who the executive was at the commission who made the decision, but many years back, the um, uh, state, uh, the, 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 the bridge is adorned with the state seals of uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania on its respective ends. And those were removed from the bridge. And there was a woman um, out of uh, Phillipsburg, uh, uh, Gloria Decker, who endeavored to uh, get those put back on the bridge um, back uh, in the early uh, 2000s. So uh, it's, it's an interesting thing that was done by that individual, so. Very fascinating. Well, with uh, with that, we will uh, we will close it up. And uh, again, Joe, this has been an incredibly fantastic presentation. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, Thank Jerry. you so much for, for joining us and to all the participants that are still on. Uh, thanks for hanging with us. It, it's again, it's been a lot of information this evening, and I, I found it incredibly valuable. So thank you, all of you, for joining us. Jr. Just one other thing, if I may. Good. I have my Good. phone number on on here. Uh, my phone malfunctioned tonight. It was so bad I had to unplug it. So I don't know when that's going to be operating, but that is my number. So, uh, so I was, I had no other choice. I just had to unplug it out of the wall. Yeah, that, that happens sometimes. <laughs> well, great. Well, uh, again, thank you so much. We uh, we really appreciate it, and uh, we we look forward to having this presentation up to up on our website uh, shortly in our uh, previous events tab. So, Joe, thank you again. Thanks so much. You bet. Bye bye. Yep. Good night. <laughs>